that I was invited here, I was thinking what I could talk about. And uh, of course, knowing that one of the topics <coughs> that is recurring is uh, the urban project Skopje 2014, um, I was thinking of a conversation I had with a Macedonian friend of mine a few years ago who was skeptical about the project but said at least at the end of the day we will have a tourist attraction which people will come to see. Uh, and I was thinking, well, maybe we should think about uh, actually more. It got me thinking about tourism uh, and nation building. So what I would like to talk to you about today uh, and discuss also is how nation branding tourism and state and nation building are connected in southeastern Europe. Uh, now this is not a topic which is entirely new and there's been a, a growing literature on nation branding. But um, if you look at that literature, a lot of it is from the perspective of marketing, of tourist, uh, 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 tourist uh, kind of industry, how to promote nations, destinations. And scholars of nationalism have not really discovered so much uh, the idea of nation branding and tourism as a focus. But uh, as you'll see, I'm trying to argue that this is one of the key sites of nation building, um, and not just in Macedonia, but elsewhere as well. And it's also a place where we have an interesting communication between nation building and um, the issue of global market economy. So, as some of you might have come to see Svetlana Slapshak's presentation and not mine, I will try to be as entertaining and as full of images to compensate for that disappointment you might have. Um, but let me start out by um, uh, a quote from two different tourist brochures. Uh, one is from the Timeless Macedonia campaign, which talks about folklore. And it says, true folklore cannot be bought or sold, but has to be, has to be earned through toil, sweat, tears, and sometimes even blood. Contrary to some who abuse its name of self-serving interest, it is not a mere entertainment to amuse the throngs or to pander to an audience. So, folklore cannot be sold. In contrast to that, the Croatian tourist site has actually two sections, which is called one to buy Croatia and the other one to sell Croatia. Of course, they don't use the word folklore, but you can buy a country and you can sell a country. And of course, that section of the tourist agency of Croatia is about, um, as, it's, as I've written there, the concept an arrangement of business meetings between Croatian tourist participants and selling the nation. And so this is the tension between, on one side, this idea of authentic nation which cannot be sold, which cannot be traded, which has to be earned in blood, uh, or even in blood and sweat, at least, and the idea of a consumer nation which is traded, which is a, a market item, which can be bought and sold like a pair of sneakers, like Coca-Cola, like a hamburger. And this is really the tension which I want to talk about. Can you sell a nation, and what does that mean to the logic of nation building, which is so often focused exactly on the opposite, on the fact that it has to be earned, that it cannot be bought or cannot be sold. So, the key focus of what I want to talk about today is this idea of nation branding, which has risen in the last two decades. It's the idea of um, presenting a country, and I think it is an as important way, or it's become as important in presenting the country as the classic topics of attention of scholars of nationalism, how the constitution defines the country, as a nation state or as a multinational state. The flags, the symbols, all of those have been classic topics of interest of researchers. But I think that the nation branding is uh, fundamentally, fundamentally interesting as well, as relevant. It shows us the way in which the country wants to sell itself, to present itself, the way it thinks the world wants to see it, or it wants to shape the image. But it's also, again, a, a place of contestation, a place of tension between the self, the way one would like to see oneself, or present oneself, and the global demands of the marketplace. And those are not the same. The global demands of the marketplace, of tourism, and others have different expectations than the ones of one's own self-perception. And this is why it's an interesting place to look at. Now, the, the branding of nations 
is, and the branding of states is not just, of course, for touristic purposes, but it's also about, as uh, Zara Volcic, uh, uh, a scholar from Australia, has called it startup nations, new nations which have no perception uh, uh, internationally, and you know, we have all heard multiple jokes about Slovenia and Slovakia being confused by American presidents and uh, you know, not, not finding countries on the map. So the idea of nation branding was the idea that countries could put themselves on the map beyond tourism, not just to attract tourists, but also for public diplomacy and for investments. Uh, and of course, while most of the nation branding campaigns in Southeastern Europe have focused on tourism, there's one which explicitly hasn't, and I will just show you as part of my campaigning program. Um, the one which you probably might be familiar with, which is Kosovo Young Europeans. This is, um, this is one of the slogans which, as you can see here, presents Kosovo uh, as the young Europeans. Uh, it's not about tourism, it's not about trying to get tourists to come to Kosovo, but it's about trying to improve the image of uh, Kosovo. So what we're, what we're seeing is different types of functions of nation branding for touristic purposes, for foreign investments, for um, changing the image. And, and proponents of nation branding have actually described it as a unique opportunity, especially for post-communist countries, to change the narrative, to basically project a different image um, which is the, to the dominant image of the countries. So in that sense, to challenge the Balkanist stereotypes of uh, countries which perceive them as backward, archaic, violence prone otherwise, or East European images of being communist, post-communist, uh, and so on. So, essentially, this is the argument that this is, in fact, for small countries, the only opportunity to redefine themselves, to be positioned. And in fact, proponents of nation branding have argued that it is a way of leapfrogging, which a small country can be perceived as positively as a big country, because again, the brand is detached from the content, right? The brand is something which you can construct irrespective of the size of the country. So in that sense, the argument is that unlike military or economic resources, the brand is something which can be working in a manner which is accessible to small countries um, and thus be, be successful. Now, this sounds all very nice, but there is, of course, real limitations, but also uh, some of the, in a certain way, interesting dynamics to domestic processes. Uh, the nation brand has to be connected to a context. It cannot be invented, it cannot be totally created out of nowhere. And of course, it has to fit both the domestic needs and realities, as well as the international demands. And so we find, in fact, this fundamental tension between, on one side, rebranding the nations as no longer East European or Balkan, but at the same time, the international marketplace often demands exactly for that exoticism, to be Balkan, the excitement of being exotic. And we find that uh, tension reflected in the nation branding. So, you know, we see very typical down there, this is from the Serbia Tourist Agency, their website, and there you can see um, uh, the slogan here, they don't have the slogan, but beauty uh, of tradition. This, I think, very much sums up the way in which very often countries uh, in the region are branding themselves. The celebration of tradition, folklore, as a central marker of identity. Now, so this project of nation branding is about creating and reaffirming an imagined community. It's about creating who is the nation, who is in and who is out. It's also an exercise in banal nationalism, what Michael Willing called uh, a bit more than a decade ago, when he said, banal nationalism is the process where not you don't have big battles, you don't have these big moments, but it's the everyday reminders of what a nation is. 
And nation branding is exactly that. It is the little advertisement which is circulating on CNN or Euronews or Al Jazeera or elsewhere, which talks about the nation or the state and which constantly reminds of a particular way in which it should be understood. Now, of course, this is absolutely nothing new. The term nation branding might be new, but it's something which, of course, goes back to the beginning, at least, of tourism. The idea that you have to sell it, right? If you have tourists, you have to sell to the tourists where to go to. It's a competitive environment. So, when, for example, tourism began in Southeastern Europe in the 19th century, um, they had to be, the destinations had to be marketed. So when, for example, Austria-Hungary opened up the Dalmatian coast to tourists, it used terminology evoking already well-known tourist destinations in marketing it. So the coast became the Riviera of Austria, which of course evoked the French Riviera, which people already knew about as an attractive tourist destination. Or places like Hwa became Madeira of Austria-Hungary. So again, evoking already well-known destinations to associate them with the new destinations, to give them a positive connotation. So these are the techniques which we, of course, still find today. So uh, we find then in the, in the, the main, of course, rise of tourism begins as a mass tourism in socialist Yugoslavia. But socialist Yugoslavia, uh, as the, the, the map in the center, was, of course, marketing the whole country, but at the same time focused most of its attention in marketing itself as a, a coastal Dalmatian uh, seaside resort. The tourists would make side trips to Basta and Sarajevo, but the main bulk of the tourists would not come to Macedonia or Serbia, but they would go to the Dalmatian coast. So much of the tourist branding of Yugoslavia was focused on one particular region and one particular type of tourists. After the end of Yugoslavia, so new countries have to reposition themselves, both as countries as well as tourist destinations. And while some of them had an obvious advantage uh, because they had been well-known tourist brands or products, such as Croatia, others had to reinvent themselves. We find a whole range of ways to represent themselves. So we have Slovenia, which took several slogans, and here are the two latest ones. First, the green piece of Europe, uh, and then the latest one, I feel Slovenia, or I feel love. Uh, it's a wordplay, as you can see there. Uh, and again, uh, these are brands, especially the I Feel Slovenia, which has been elaborated with the assistance of international marketing, um, international marketing agencies. So these are, you know, costly investments into nation branding. Uh, and the brand of I Feel Slovenia was established in response to the perception that the previous brand was insufficiently coherent. So one of these ideas of nation branding is to create a coherent image which permeates the entire self-presentation of the country, not just the government website, but also to the non-governmental sphere. The idea of co-participation is essential. And again, Slovenia emphasized its environmental uh, and natural uh, association with those tourist uh, campaigns. And again, that was not just about tourism, but it's also about creating a positive image associating the country with nature uh, and with, in a certain way, distancing itself from the Balkans, but as a central European, central piece of Europe. Croatia similarly uh, first took the slogan, small country for a great holiday, um, and then, of course, the one which is now well known as the Mediterranean as it once was. Now, of course, the second one in particular evokes, again, the Dalmatian part of Croatia, which most has most tourists. So it is about, again, similar to the Yugoslav experience, reducing the destination to one area for understandable reasons. Um, in the first decade, of course, under Franjo Tudjman, um, there wasn't much tourism, but there were efforts to try to rebuild it, and again, to also use tourism as a way to position Croatia differently. So tourist pressure from the late 90s, for example, described Croatia as a place which is 90% <coughs> Catholic, thus tourists might be reminded of Spain, Italy, uh, or France. Uh, churches are full on Sundays and people like their families. Right? So, of course, on one side you create a tourist image of evoking a already established tourist destination, but you're also packaging a particular idea of the nation, i.e. a Catholic nation, uh, where churches are full on Sundays, which although I don't think is quite as accurate of a description as they were hoping for, um, 
but that is the, that is the idea. Um, Serbia used the slogan of landscape painted from the heart, which in the 1990s was a landscape without minorities, a mono-ethnic uh, orthodox nation, um, which became more enriched with other identities as the regime of Slobodan and Milosevic fell. Uh, Montenegro, again, as another example, first took the slogan ecological state, which is of course in its constitution, uh, which seemed rather uh, kind of ironic considering the state of Montenegro in the 1990s when it was advertising this. And later on, it switched to the, to the term wild beauty, again evoking uh, aesthetics and then evo evoking wildness. So it has this kind of, it plays with the Balkans, the wildness of the Balkans, in a way in which, for example, Slovenia wouldn't. So wild beauty is very much evoking both aesthetic, but also in a certain way, the, the wildness of the Balkans, which uh, so Montenegro doesn't distance itself in the same way as Croatia and Slovenia does from that aspect. Um, now, there is a feedback loop. Nation branding, of course, is not just uh, about, about uh, the perception abroad. Uh, this, the, the video clips, which are the most visible, uh, the visible expression of that, are discussed, shown domestically. So, um, for example, when Serbia launched its first videos on CNN, it gained a lot of attention in Serbia proper, um, and mostly for uh, kind of this, the scandalous reasons, so to speak, because uh, in the case of this video clip, what was created controversy in Serbia was when it was shown on CNN in 2007, is that um, it showed the River Danube with a monastery on it, or a church on it, as you will see in a second, um, which actually happens to be this one here in Romania. So it's on the, the border, but that church is on the Romanian side. So it created a lot of controversy in Serbia because how, how come we don't have enough own churches that we have to show on CNN Romanian churches to advertise our country? So this created some stir. Now, of course, the other ironic uh, development was that CNN accidentally showed this clip with the music uh, for the Kazakhstan nation branding um, and created again a scandal in Serbia. How come that we are mixed up with Kazakhstan, which is of course uh, rather rather scandalous in the way in which one tries to position itself as European and not as a star, which is of course uh, rather negative. Now of course it reflects the fact that all of those clips are <coughs> most of them, uh, especially uh, from uh, from Serbia, from Macedonia as well. Mania uh, are underlined with kind of some kind of generic ethno music, which for uh, an American audience or the operator at CNN could be easily confused with the same kind of ethno music which would be played with the Kazakh advertisement of the country. Um, so there is a feedback loop, there is a perception, there is a debate about nation branding back home, thus it matters in many ways. Now, some of the scholars of um, of or observers of nation branding said maybe this is actually something positive. It's uh, nation branding is something which might um, be an alternative to nationalism. So Peter van Ham, who wrote in Foreign Affairs about nation branding a decade ago, said that state branding is gradually supplanting nationalism. By marginalizing nationalist chauvinism, the brand state is contributing greatly to the further pacification of Europe. So the idea that the brand is something which is uh, pacifying the nation because again if you're selling yourself you don't sell yourself by saying by talking about all the ethnic cleansing you've engaged in or all the minorities you've uh, repressed and so on so in that sense you can follow this argument and other scholars who looked at the nation branding campaigns in Bulgaria and Romania uh, have argued that national identity is appropriate for the purposes of neoliberal globalization uh, via commodification and that constrains national identity in an ahistorical, decontextualized, depoliticized framework, resulting in a form of national identity light. So similarly, not arguing it's replacing nationalism, but it's some kind of light version of that. Um, and I would rather um, side with others who are more skeptical of that view, who actually see nation branding as a site of nation building and of nationalism. So uh, Michael uh, Curtis has written about uh, tourism uh, in the United States and its impact and how it reflects nationalism, basically takes the argument of Benedict Anderson, who writes about censuses, maps, and museums in his classic imagined communities, and says tourism sites 
just like censuses maps and museums may project the hegemonic or official discourse of nationalism. So they are not nationalism light, but they are a place where you can project it. And it might look ahistorical, it might be, of course, negotiated in a confrontation or in conflict with global demands, but so are national projects and nationalism always. They're always negotiated in face and in dialogue with uh, alternatives or challengers or restraining items. Now, of course, the challenge which is confronted uh, with nation branding is that nation branding requires selling a state, not, a not, not an ethnic group, um, but of course, many states define themselves as nation states. So how to reconcile the state and the nation? Again, nothing unique to nation branding, but this challenge also exists there. So, for example, we have an influential book by, by John and Jean uh, Komarov called Ethnicity Inc., which talks about the way in which ethnic groups have commodified. Uh, and she looks at, particular, they look particularly in South Africa, how Zulu nation and other nations have used uh, the rise of commercialism to sell uh, and to you know, mass produce in a certain way culture for consumption. Uh, and they argue that this is, they, they don't pass judgment on it, but they observe this as a central feature of many ethno nations today, where on one side there's global demand for the exotic, the ethnic, the world music, the ethno art, the tribal arts of the world, and also uh, group identities can be reaffirmed or can be enhanced through that. The participation in the marketplace gives currency, not just economic currency, but currency legitimacy. It gives a particular identity, global, uh, global recognition, brand recognition, and this can be translated into political and symbolic capital back in the country. But again, with nation branding, the challenge is that you cannot sell yourself as a purely ethnic nation state because this is, in a certain way, something which is internationally not easily uh, arguable. So, in this sense, I would say that this is why nation branding is interesting, because it's a consumerist form of nationalism, as Zara Volcic and uh, Mark Andreevich have argued. It's, it's really consumer nationalism. It's, uh, it's making a product which you can sell. Um, so you are in a marketplace. You have to compete with other nations. You're not just competing with your neighbors, you're competing with Kazakhstan or Indonesia or Singapore. This is the way you But you're also talking about the confrontation between the self-perception and the way in which externals want to perceive you, are willing to accept uh, the discourse. Um, and again, about, and this is why it's also, it's about creating a hegemony of a particular national identity. Because again, nation branding is about the coherence of the brand. You can't have ten ways of looking at Coca-Cola. There has to be one way in which a brand is packaged. And the same with the nation. If you accept the logic of nation branding, it's about one way in which the nation should be packaged. So when I was earlier mentioning, I, I feel Slovenia, I feel love, this was about the idea that this wouldn't just be the tourist slogan, but this would be used by investors, this would be used by by business fora, this would be used by NGOs. Again, about one hegemonic way of looking at the nation and defining it. Uh, and so in that sense, it is not at all benign, but it is about imposing one view on the larger on the larger way in which the nation can be viewed. And of course, we know that so nations can come to the case of be Macedonia, because again, this is where we are. Uh, and uh, so the main there are multiple nation branding tools, but the one I will look at is the Timeless Macedonia campaign, which has been uh, basically launched uh, four years or three years ago, approximately, which again has been presenting Macedonia to the outside world for tourist purposes. And I will just show you, uh, many of you might be familiar with those, the, the multiple video clips, but the, the ones uh, which are, um, uh, which are, uh, most prominent. So I will have two, two here uh, for you to look at and uh, maybe we can like, give you some thoughts.
mic close to the computer.
to, uh, this, uh, to this view, just to kind of give you um, the way in which the country and the region brands itself differently. This is, so this is the most prominent Montenegro in video. Uh, because this is not, or 
Milo Dukanovic, uh, Prime Minister of Montenegro, plus that would fill half of the tourist brochure, but that's a different story. But these are not seen as relevant, but again in Macedonia, this, this, there doesn't seem to be yet this kind of synthetic, fully developed nation brand externally, because again, it's based on tensions of how to reconstruct nation, uh, national narratives internally. Now, the interesting dimension of Macedonia is, of course, that there is this flip side to the external brand of timeless Macedonia that's been the campaign which all of you are probably familiar with in domesticating the locals, in trying to convince the locals to behave in a manner which would be suitable for the video clip or the presentation of the video clip. So, of course, this campaign contained a number of video clips of an imaginary uh, Australian um, going through Macedonia and describing the risks of Macedonian everyday life for tourists. Here's just one. historical narrative 
but rather in short clips of recognizable historical events rather than in long narratives of historical origin, and that that creates an inherent tension. Then there is this element which I started out with, which is the unintended consequences of, uh, of nation branding, or what I um, call the Disneyland effect of Skopje 2014, that in fact there is a domestic intention to create a brand of a nation, but that in fact the outside visitor will want to see it not to admire this brand, but to mock it, because it is ridiculous. For them, this is not a sign of a new, desirable, national brand, but rather something which is entertaining. So, it is quite ironic that I wrote a, a, an Austrian newspaper a comment on the Skopje 2014, and it was published in the travel section. Um, so, in fact, I might have contributed to the rise of tourists from Austria coming to visit Skopje, although, as, you, uh, as those of you who might be interested in reading this article, will find it certainly not praising, in particular, the way in which uh, this project is presenting itself. Now, the last observation is that there is an ironic tension there that if you take the clip of Macedonia and you would remove the name and replace it with a clip of Bulgaria or Romania or Serbia, for most outsiders, they will not be able to tell the difference. Um, that the attempt to create a unique brand, in fact, ends up exactly copying that of others that those who are watching CNN and seeing these different countries presenting themselves will find that, in fact, the nation brand creates, in many ways, the kind of Burger King versus McDonald's dilemma for Balkan nations, where uh, one is Burger King, the other one is McDonald's, but really, you have to be a gourmet to tell the difference. Um, and so you get the cookie-cutter Balkan nation, which is traditional, yet modern, a little bit, which is East and West, which shows churches and nature, um, which is devoid of people unless they are dressing up in traditional outfits for the most part. And in that sense, um, it reaffirms very much the kind of Western views of the exotic, the strange, uh, of, of the Balkans. And this is why I placed the, the fake travel guide to Mulvania which was published a few years ago by Australian writers who invented a whole country called Mulvania uh, and wrote a travel guide to it of this imaginary country. I think a land untouched by modern dentistry is the slogan. Um, <laughs> so in that sense, this is, I think, where the circle closes itself. Thank you so much. Symptoms of last night will be again confirmed kind of today because I have to disagree with that. So what I will try to do is maybe uh, from what you presented uh, try to push further some of the issues uh, into maybe a field which is quite dear to me and it is uh, the classical analysis of nationalism and especially how it is intertwined with uh, neoliberal capitalism today and how does it work. Basically, I would start with the, uh, a more general approach on branding as a phenomenon, as such, which I consider has come up to the Balkans finally uh, from the other tendencies uh, from the United States and Western Europe as a phenomenon which uh, is one of the tendencies of the postmodern neoliberalism, uh, which tends to transform uh, most of the times hardcore political processes and political tendencies into other cultural issues, uh, commercial issues, through the commodification and kind of getting them ready packed for uh, for uh, for the market. And basically. Um, when we look, uh, as you said, very often these commercials, uh, they do appear in CNN. Uh, even people from Macedonia would get the feeling that uh, it's not anymore about uh, state, about politics, about big struggles, about uh, democracy issues. Uh, we can say that 
the true branding to the phenomenon of the brand, it, the whole kind of classical categories of analyzing and approaching the state are transformed into this kind of postmodernist neoliberal categories of a corporized uh, entity, um, advertising and marketing instead of struggles and politics inside become, uh, in, an, become an increasingly important factor for the country. And then also imagery, imagery replaces uh, uh, quite a lot of quite a lot of uh, debates and struggles that would that would otherwise uh, be taking place inside the country. And then exactly what happens is I think you just mentioned it in the end, and that was that was uh, one of the, one of the points there is that uh, the image becomes a new form of sovereignty. Uh, basically, if you could. Uh, uh, make a crime by uh, attacking the uh, state's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Now you have an expanded area and space of how you can kind of damage your state through not confirming to the brand and basically the brand has now become a sort of a national interest. Uh, uh, I hope it will not be included in the constitution in the, <laughs> in the, in the, in the, in the coming years and it becomes kind of a, a legally protected legally protected area of the, of, of the state. But what actually uh, I would like to also um, bring in some uh, uh, concrete uh, problem that I see emerge uh, when we have this mashup of uh, nationalism, branding processes and neoliberalism and the tendencies uh, inside, inside uh, the region of Southeastern Europe. And basically I think that uh, we do have to and still have to deal with classical, in a classical way with nationalism, especially in the southeastern Europe where we see a decline in enthusiasm for uh, transnational, international sorts of uh, uh, networks, which I believe is a, a reaction to the globalization and Europeanization processes which um, have caused certain sorts of uh, crises within these countries and in most of the cases the national answer to this crisis uh, which, is, which are called by these international market dynamics are usually being forwarded in the best way, unfortunately, by uh, right-wing, uh, ultra-right-wing groups. And I think that uh, sometimes uh, these sort of groups, they do, influence, uh, they do influence the ruling classes who basically build the image through, build an image for the country through the access that they have to the media, to the uh, political elites, and basically, a uh, large majority of the population is deprived even uh, to be a part in the branding of the country uh, because this image of the ruling classes is projected as a viable image for all the country. And basically, uh, by that, you do an extra favor to the ruling classes and basically you exclude a large majority, a large portion of the population to have, to have access to the brand of the country, which, as we saw, is also intended for internal consumption. Uh, I will also, I would like to also stress two concrete examples on how internal, uh, on how internally and internationally this branding process works. And basically, in Macedonia, I would um, also uh, like to comment on a branding process which is not as a commercially advertised branding process, but which is which has become a political rhetoric, which has a, a branding process which is increasingly uh, uh, causing further internal divisions in Macedonia through the binary logic of the government that we have, which later just uh, uh, reflects this logic of parallelism and indifference throughout the society. But basically, it is, I will go through the current uh, uh, ruling parties, if you see that the Albanian political party uh, the Democratic Union for Integration, the con constant tendency is to try to sell the current Macedonia, since they are in power, as a new brand, as a country which accommodates the ethnic needs of Albanians uh, in the country um, through different ways, different imagery and statistics. Uh, basically, they try to rebrand Macedonia from this heritage and the memory as a country which discriminates Albanians now they are in power, so they have rebranded the country and now they're trying to self interpret this brand. On the other hand, we know that the other political party from the same government, through the political rhetoric, 
and tries to build an image of the country where we have like a monolithic identity which is elevated to national interest and this kind of brand has not so much space for other ethnic groups. And another case which I would like also to um, stress and put uh, in link, uh, link together how uh, branding processes can sometimes lead and contribute to the increase in nationalism inside in such countries is the case with uh, young Europeans, the Kosovo Commission and the Kosovo I say, uh, 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 branding process. I don't know why did they, they decided on that, on that model, which then uh, provided a uh, hugely problematic insight also. Because there was a strong reaction inside from groups such as uh, the Vivendosi movement, which is now becoming a serious political party there. Um, who kind of tried to launch an internal campaign uh, that would contradict the young Europeans uh, imagery that is built for Kosovo and uh, they wanted to kind of internally spread a kind of a reaction to this campaign of Kosovo the old Albanians uh, trying to uh, focus on the on the heritage of, uh, of, of the nation and basically it created internal internal uh, tensions and, uh, and contradictions inside Kosovo uh, and basically it gave rise to more extreme nationalist arguments it gave rise to kind of an acceptance of the new Kosovo flag because uh, it does not uh, reflect the ethnic composition and the feeling of the majority in Kosovo and so basically uh, sometimes the, the, this branding process does not do favor internally it, it, Exactly, it just fuels more, more contradictions. And in the case of Macedonia as well, we have always, uh, it was interesting to see that um, some part of the Albanian uh, uh, population has tried to, to implement the percentage, the awkward framework percentage in the, in the time of Macedonia. I, like, ah, I saw like three churches, but two mosques only. Okay, it can't, it's not. It's, it's even more represented than it, than it should be. And basically, I think that another uh, dangerous aspect of uh, branding, to, uh, of this uh, branding tendencies that is that, that are going on throughout the southeastern Europe region, is that they kind of uh, work very much on the surface because of the imagery that they use, and uh, basically they cover up processes in the bottom, which in several countries around the uh, southeastern Europe, these processes are linked to the reintroduction and the reinvention of national myths. Which do not make it, which do not make their direct way in the branding and in, the, in their advertising, or sometimes they do, as in as in, as in our case. Uh, and thus, uh, I think if this uh, becomes one of the uh, ways to look upon the region through the brands that are required by the global market exchange, I think that we will largely fail to basically understand the bottom processes, as I said, through which more dangerous and more uh, 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 extreme national myths are being reintroduced and or, or reinvented and are being uh, uh, opposing a challenge for the region for the region in the future. I will just stop to you for the comments. Or if you have questions from now the floor is basically open for discussion. supposed to be a dialogue you are up So, anyone? I just wanted to hear your comment on the only country that wasn't in the presentation, Bosnia and Herzegovina. In my opinion, there's, I don't know if it's a specific case and it's only this country, but there, there's a tendency to use victimization as nation branding and a selling point for tourists. So if you go to Sarajevo, half of the National Museum is dedicated to the siege of Sarajevo, depicted in a very simplistic way for tourists. And then in Mosta, you have, don't forget, stones reminding people of the fall of the bridge. Do you think it is specific or is this something that uh, per directly or indirectly is created as, as propaganda for the tourists 
to come and visit because in my opinion most of the tourists go to Bosnia and Herzegovina because of the war. So what is your opinion on that? But of course Bosnia is a I didn't bring it up because it doesn't actually have a kind of a, a state branding campaign, which is un, which is unsurprising considering that probably couldn't have an agreement on that. Or it would have to be three different campaigns, and no other country would market itself based on the past conflict. I and mean, this is something uh, you know, young Europeans Kosovo campaign does not mention the war, does not mention it. I mean, the whole clip is about showing young people who put together the country of different pieces and that fits nicely into the map of the Balkans. So in that sense, it's kind of fitting well with its neighbors uh, uh, is, is, is what it suggests. Now, uh, also Croatia, of course, does not mention the war. I mean, it would be foolish. I mean, the whole effort has always been to ignore it, put it aside. Uh, Bosnia, of course, in certain places does talk about that. Uh, I don't think it's kind of, a, I don't think there's any strategic thought behind it. It's, it's just, uh, you know, in a certain way it happens where it does. Uh, because of course tourists want to know about it. Right? So there is this, uh, there is the demand, consumer-driven demand for going there because of the war, seeing the bridge which was destroyed and rebuilt, and seeing the, the, the sort of Sarajevo roses, the, the grenades which have been covered with uh, red, uh, red uh, paint and so on. Um, but you also have the other side. I mean, I, I, I remember seeing tourist slogans of Republika Srpska in, in Belgium, for example, which showed a guy snowboarding. And says, you know, come to Republika Srpska for winter holidays. Uh, as if Republika Srpska is a country of its own, and B, you know, as if that's a place you go for ski. I mean, yes, you can, but from Brussels it seems a rather strange idea. So I think you have both the forgetting and the remembering as part of, but again, not as part of a central plan, branding exercise, but rather as, as everything in Bosnia divided and fragmented. Thanks for the marvelous presentation. Uh, but I have one comment, two comments actually, or two questions. I'm not sure if I'm fresh or crazy. Uh, could, first one is about the, you mentioned exercising banality of nationalism through these uh, commercials. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's a so benign process, it's, it's much more uh, serious than, than just uh, exercising uh, nationalism. Because uh, one of the things that you mentioned about Slovenia, the, the Slovenian campaign, Slovenians are very well versed in this kind of using of touristic campaigns for, for, for promoting some other more profound uh, ideas. In, uh, back in the 80s, there was a campaign called Slovenia Moja de Gela. It was a touristic campaign between Yugoslavia. It was highly controversial because it was time of the rise of the nationalism in, uh, in each of the republics, and Slovenia went headlong in this campaign. The law was with a with a clip uh, of the lipa, which is the, the first currency in Slovenia later on, and so on. So they used this national symbolism that was later on worked out much better in the time of independence, but it was kind of preparatory uh, setting, uh, and it was very well marketed. So it's a uh, it, it was used by the political elite uh, to prepare the idea of independent Slovenia. I'm not, I have no position about if it was right or wrong or you know. But however, it, it, it shows that the power of this, of the, of this uh, marketing tool. And then, uh, so that could be a question or a comment only. And then, when we speak about Skopje 2014, in, in this case, uh, I think that one thing that is missing from, from the whole presentation, maybe it's just, I mean, it's not negative to mind, but I think it's very important to, to, to put in perspective the idea of the uh, city branding, which is very well covered in literature, in, uh, uh, in anthropology, sociology, and in geography. Uh, we, we speak about city branding as a part of positioning the city as a global world or regional centers and stuff like that, cosmopolitan or not. So, Skopje 2014 is interesting for that because it's also about a city and we have to hear politics of scale. Uh, do we go with the, with the with representation of the city of Skopje as a Macedonia, compressed Macedonia historically and uh, spatially into, into 100 square meters or 1,000 square meters or we have something else, we have just city planning or we have nation planning. So, implications are much wider here. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks, Colin. Um, I would, when I, when I use the term of banal nationalism, of course, that banal does not suggest that it's benign or even, or even um, not with consequences. I mean, I think the whole argument which Michael Billing makes, in fact, that the kind of it's about the everyday reminder. It's not about the glorious battles. It's not about a call for arms, but it's about the kind of. I mean, I think he uses the example of the, the oath of allegiance, the, the pledge of allegiance, which American school children have to say every day in school, which uh, becomes just a routine. And I think this nation branding is a routine. It's normal. It's expected. Of course, you present a country in a certain consumer package. Uh, and I think that's more what I was getting at. That, and again, it normalizes certain things. And I think the example you gave of Slovenia is exactly that: that it creates a normality about certain things. So the fact that we see images of antiquity, for example, in this particular timeless Macedonia clip, uh, such becomes then a normality, which then, even if you might not subscribe to the antiquization uh, campaign in Macedonia and the whole argument, becomes normal. Because you're associating Macedonia with Greeks, Macedonians, whoever, Romans, uh, people of antiquity sitting and uh, living a decadent life. Um, and, and that, 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 so I think that's, that's where it's powerful. And again, and there I see also that, that, that there's, a, there's a nice opportunity there. Because of course, many places in Europe are sites of antiquity, right? For, for whatever historical reasons. Uh, and they also advertise antiquity as a tourist selling point. Um, and so in that sense, there's nothing inherently problematic with selling your tourist attraction by sites of antiquity. Now, of course, it becomes a problem if that is combined with the domestic discourse of establishing continuity of nation, identity, a people between antiquity and, and, the, and, and the, the, the contemporary. And that's where it becomes, so that it becomes a, a highly politicized, problematic discourse where showing people uh, eating in antiquity in a tourist clip uh, in Slovenia wouldn't be as problematic because this is not what Slovenian national discourse is about, but it is in Macedonia at the moment. And this is why uh, this banality is, is, can be very powerful. The second point about city branding, I think that's a very interesting observation. I think we see, um, I mean, we have to look at it, I think, in a longer historical perspective. One of the references which I think is interesting to look at is uh, village museums. Uh, as a historical phenomena, which goes back to nation-state building. We find this everywhere as part of the nation-state building, is that nation-states put together villages composed out of eclectic buildings from the country to demonstrate to the people of what the nation is composed of. Right? Um, so the idea is that the nation is diverse yet unified, and it creates these sites where people can visit and discover the authentic uh, nature of the country, uh, and in fact, this, this aim of authenticity is, is, is very essential to, to this kind of place branding. In fact, there was an interesting, Montenegro has a very elaborate discourse of, multi, of diversity as part of its tourist branding. In fact, it has a 60-page brochure on multi, multicultural Montenegro. It's quite different. It's interesting, it's very different from Macedonia, self-presentation. But one of them is the intertwining of various cultures and an authentic folk tradition. And it tries to, again, shows it is kind of trying to do both, uh, be diverse yet authentic. Um, so the Village Museum is one place, and I think the, the recent, uh, the recent I think where one has to look at Muscopia 2014 in the context of, well, there's once at the so-called ethnocellos, uh, the building of, of contemporary village museums, but which are not actually real buildings, but they are new, newly built buildings put together. Um, and here in particular comes to mind Andrichgrad in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which has uh, just been built by, by Emir slash Nemanja Kustolica, um, close to Visegrad, which is a, a kind of a fake, uh, I don't know how to describe it, a, a fake town uh, devoted to Ivo Andrich, uh, pseudo-Mediterranean, pseudo-Balkan, um, uh, with the, again, the idea of building a new city um, and I think that it's interesting to see Scorpio 2014 in this effort to build a new authentic uh, city based on some kind of seemingly authentic style, right? because again, I, mean, I think 
one of the interesting elements of Scorpio 2014, although every building is new, uh, there's this claim of authenticity behind it, that it is actually more authentic than the modernist architecture of Skopje after the earthquake or any other style. So that even the reconstruction of old buildings is always embellished and different from the actual old building. It's bigger, more golden, more glamorous, and so on, but it's more authentic in a certain way. So, um, I mean, it always reminds me of this very well-known sentence uttered during the wars of the 1990s by the mayor of Trebinje uh, when Dubrovnik was shelled, saying we will rebuild an, an, uh, an older uh, Dubrovnik after the war. And so this idea that you can actually build an older, more authentic city from new is something which I think is intrinsically linked to the, to the ideas of, of, of nationalism. Florian, uh, whether he thinks that this process of nation uh, branding is uh, its main aim is commercial, so it's uh, using na uh, national nationalism and national cultural heritage in order to sell something which is purely commercial for the purposes of tourism, uh, whether it uses the means of uh, corporate capital for, of market, of marketing to sell an image of a nation. So whether it's actually the other way around, it just uses the means of capitalist market in order to create and fix an image of a nation for the purposes of nationalism, of fixing uh, an idea of a nation and instilling a definition of an initiative, which is uh, more uh, because it's branded, because you know branding is the language of the contemporary society. You know, I think, I think these are not. I don't think they're they're alternatives. I think they're exactly. This is, I think, also the tension that on uh -huh. one side, nation branding is about selling the nation to outsiders, and there it has to be sold in a particular way. It has to be fairly ahistorical. It has to be fairly. Uh, it has to appear to a certain repertoire of. of ideas of, of recognizable features, right? Um, it has to be, it's, it's, it's in that sense, it's subject to the laws of, of advertising. <coughs> but it also, of course, it fixes a particular narrative. So if you, if you portray antiquity, or if you portray uh, the, the ethnic, uh, folkloristic nature of the nation, so to speak, uh, then that's also fixing it, it's giving it legitimacy. Because, uh, especially if it's successful, I mean, again, if it fails, because a brand can fail, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay. if the brand fails, i.e., if it doesn't have traction, then of course the national narrative is not legitimized to it. But, I mean, the whole argument in, in advertising is that a brand can be more valuable than the product, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, people would argue that the biggest brands in the world, the, the value derived from the brand, not from the product itself. We detach the brand from the product. So, if you're a successful nation brand, you can detach the brand from the product. You can detach, in a certain way, any reality of the nation from the perception of the nation. Of course, there's a link from between the two, but the idea is, of course, that you have this idea of what Macedonia or Montenegro or whatever Croatia is, which is living a life of its own. And of course, that is a very tempting uh, very tempting for national nationalist narrative because that's exactly what nationalism is also about. It's about creating its utopia, right? It, it creates some kind of idea of the past and the future and the nation. And this is, in, in that sense, there is a similarity between the the consumerist idea of a brand which is detached from reality and the nationalist utopia, which again mm -hmm. can be detach itself from reality. So in that sense, there is a there is a, a similar kind of idea. And, and if, if, if successful. For, uh, my opinion is that uh, the biggest uh, nation in the industry is actually the film industry. Uh, and uh, for example, for the Macedonian film industry especially the films of uh, Milcho Manchevsky, if you have seen them, uh, have uh, portrayed this image of uh, a savage Balkan 
state where uh, the laws of, of uh, civilized of, of the civilized world and civilized Europe do not uh, apply. So you you, you see uh, you see garbage in the streets, you see old buses, you see all these kinds of things that are not actually here, and it portrays a picture. Uh, almost a self-humiliating picture of Macedonia that actually it's not quite true. So I think that, uh, and these films are very, uh, very uh, successful and Westerners built their uh, ideas of Macedonia based on these films. And I feel that uh, those, uh, uh, those images that the Westerners have about Macedonia are more uh, influenced by the film industry than uh, from the uh, these uh, short clips that appear on CNN or, or wherever. And also, there is a quite recent example of a film that made uh, a big impact. It's called it's a horror movie, uh, Hostel, uh, by Eli Roth, and it was produced by Quentin Tarantino. It was it is set in Slovakia and some teenagers come to a hostel in Slovakia and they get massacred and uh, the, actually the Slovakian government uh, filed a, a, a request for a, a, a lawsuit against Eli Roth and he was uh, uh, considered a, a persona non grata in Slovakia I suppose for one period because this film created uh, much more uh, damage to the Slovakian, the Slovakian image as a tourist attraction uh, than that it could be repaired uh, through some kind of a, of a positive uh, advertising campaign. So my uh, question is, uh, how is, how do you feel about the impact of the film industry on the uh, nation branding process? Thanks. I, I, I agree with you that uh, I mean, again, a brand is a very fragile, uh, you know, very fragile product, right? I mean, a very fragile. I mean, uh, you, with, a, with a, a product, right? If there is a story of, I don't know, you find uh, I don't know, a cockroach in a Coca-Cola bottle that d destroys, you know, years of advertising, and of course, the same is for nation brands, right? They're vulnerable to um, alternative narratives. And I think films are very powerful. But it's actually interesting, Machevsky made the first uh, time this Macedonia clip. He's the director of that. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, so in that sense, he's both uh, <laughs> responsible for both. Um, but I mean, actually, I think his films, and uh, again, are part of this kind of self balkanization um, in some of his films, I mean, especially before the rain. Um, um, in this idea, again, it's very similar in many ways, different, different content, but it's this ahistorical. A place I mean, again here it's a place of a historical beauty, but it's uh, there is a place of a historical violence, but it's this kind of uh, very cyclical idea of, of of history and repeating itself and so on. So that sense, it has some very similar features. Um, and I think there's a whole genre of self-organizing uh, movies. I mean, starting with Ene Kustovitz's Underground to um, Balkan Khan, for example. Um, Parada in Serbia, and so on. I mean, there's a whole genre of film which celebrate the own crazy wildness, which of course have become also part of, uh, I would say, brand Balkans, right? There's a Balkan brand in Western Europe and North America, uh, which is uh, separate from the nation brand, which is exactly non-national, which is transnational, Balkan parties, right? If you go any place in Western Europe you see advertising for Balkan parties and it means exactly that. It's supposed to be wild and crazy and you know people uh, you know destroying glass bottles on their heads and getting drunk and gypsy music and so on. So there's a whole celebration of that uh, you know which also you know represented by, by you know artists like Chantel for example with you know Ziganisatia you know use playing with these terms you know of of of, of, of Roma and, 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 and gypsies quite openly and Balkan in this package. I mean, it's, that's of course interesting, an interesting contradiction that this package of it actually this kind of unhinged emotional wildness uh, is, is actually probably the most successful brand of, of, of the Balkans. Um, 
That's what gets people to go to the parties, to listen to the music, is, you know, best-selling. It's ironic, of course, that the best-selling, and I think uh, an anthropologist, Carol Silverman, has, has pointed this out, that the best-selling Roma music or kind of uses of Balkan music are, you know, Chantel, is, his name is called Stefan Hantel. He's a, a German guy who makes music and even disguises himself with a name which sounds uh, kind of somewhat exotic and uh, but, you know, uh, Balkan or whatever. Um, but but that, that's, that, that's a product which sells uh, and which is actually one which is in contradiction to the, to the kind of more sanitized self-image of the individual nation states, but uh, which is maybe a more successful product at the end of the day. Well, first of all, thank you for an interesting presentation. And I really like the way that you are using the um, analysis of the narratives of this uh, commercials, it reminded me very much of uh, the classic of the Homi K. Baba, the nation and the narration, which uh, I always come back when I look at the way that uh, the modern marketplace and uh, uh, the commercial uh, part of branding uh, the nation plays a, a role in creation in advertisements uh, such as the ones that you have uh, described there. But always when I watch these advertisements, um, I remember the advertisements about Switzerland. A Switzerland is a nation. I mean, a Switzerland is a nation, question mark, okay? So, uh, uh, about uh, branding Switzerland through uh, the uh, production of the watches, etc. And this kind of uh, weird comparison comes in, uh, uh, in mind, in saying, okay, what we are dealing with here is um, really what you have uh, mentioned as a tension between branding and commercialization and tension about building a, a nation. And uh, then my mind jumps into a comparison of Balkan as a new orient to the West. You know, that kind of the orientalization of the exotic place. Because the minds of uh, the recent population are more uh, concerned, uh, they, they know more about the war in former Yugoslavia than about, uh, I don't know, Lawrence of Arabia. And this kind of uh, associative uh, links uh, of the general public, of the audiences worldwide, and uh, the way uh, that uh, uh, the images play, uh, probably the, uh, the, the, the part that defines the way that the nation is presented nowadays, because not very many people uh, read travel books anymore, okay? They, uh, uh, they watch short commercials, they watch short, short tourist films, so if you pack them as much, with as much history, but uh, historical references which are still fresh in the mind of the public or something that they have heard of, this is why the Croatia in their campaigns uh, uh, recall that they uh, uh, are a nation from the 7th century. For example, there is a very well-known uh, uh, new composed folk song by Jankovic, I think, Bernard Jankovic, about nation from the 7th century, which I'm jumping to Kosovo now, and the Kosovo as young nation. Uh, a celebratory uh, 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 branding of Kosovo is the youngest uh, uh, country in Europe, which didn't uh, mix well with the national feelings of Albania. But, I mean, when you are doing these videos, these promotion campaigns, usually it, it goes through agencies that take into account what the expectations of the public, uh, of the international public, are. Uh, in contrast, uh, story 2014 was made by actually uh, if, you know, uh, local uh, architects and a project that we, it's not very clear who designed it in the first place. And, um, and it, it has many elements that don't appeal to foreigners. It's more about nation building in the country. Like all the different heroes, the only people that know well history can identify and things like that. So um, I think there is a difference there, and it's important that you know I, the, the effect on tourism is a secondary effect, and the discussion that is brought up as an argument in favor of the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can only agree with you. I, I totally think, of course, COVID 2014 is not a project of, of 
Jewish purposes, it has a domestic function, very clearly, exactly as you, as you state. I think there's no, there's no doubt that this is a more kind of a post-factum justification for the project, um, to say, well, it's also good for tourists. And that was one of the arguments that they made a few, few, few months ago. It, and there was some statistics that the tourism story has climbed by fantastic 3%. And they've tried this to Scopy 2014. But there was a group of bloggers, I think, who collected uh, blog posts of people who had come to Scopy. And there were over 100 uh, people who blog usually and have um, commented or written articles on Scopy. And all of them were like making jokes on the, on the city. And then there was an article appeared of this group who said that, yes, it has most probably increased a bit because of Scopy uh, 2014, but uh, all for the wrong reasons.